upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Glory be in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let us say among the nations that the Lord reigneth. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the woods sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Amen.
Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear God, before time begins, and after all time ends, you still are God. Your God of the present moment it is here at this time in this space that we worship you. Before our earliest memories, you knew us. And after all memories shall cease, you will know us still. Oh God, how gracious you are to your people. You, the one who restores our souls time and time again, you forgive us of our distractions. When we wander far from you, you call us back and give us new life. The song reminds us, your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be our guide where our feet may fail and fear surrounds us. You've never failed and you won't start now. God, we pray to you this morning because so many in the sounds, under the sound of our voices, need you deeply today. We pray, O oh Lord, for the longtime friends of Montgomery Hills Baptist Church, Asir and Josiah, who have asked that this community pray with them and for them as they prepare for a 50 mile hike in Seattle this coming week. God, with so much heat and so many heat waves across the land, we pray that you be with them and keep them and protect them and keep them safe. Be as the trees that provide shade physically and spiritually for them on this journey. God, we pray for Mildred who continues to receive care from the recent fall. And yes, she is getting better, and God, we pray that you see her through to full healing and recovery. And now, God, we pray for those who carry heavy burdens today, knowing that you are the one who lightens every load. You said that we ought to cast our burdens on you for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And so today, God, we pray for Jonathan and Suresh and Lachman today as they carry the heavy weights of health concerns for Jonathan. God, teach us to be a community that shoulders those with them together. And where they are now, God, give them a sense of rest and peace in the midst of their storm. God, we pray for Lynn this morning, thankful for successful surgery, and we're praying for a healthy and full recovery. God, we pray for Kathy and all of the health issues that she has undergone and she has been a friend to us. And now, God, we pray that you be one of a keeper and sustainer to her. We pray for thee. The family of Adrian Vaughn who are grieving the death of Adrian. And God, we pray this morning for my friend. Grieves the death of her teenage son this past weekend. These are heavy things, O oh God. We cannot bear them alone. God, we pray for the unrest in our world, for the war and conflicts around nations. We ask, dear God, that you, the Prince of Peace, keep moving, keep calling all nations and all people to the peace that only you can provide. Pray 
ready for Senegal and Nigeria and Cameroon and Haiti, Congo and Ethiopia, Ukraine and Turkey and so many other places. You are the one who guides our footsteps, O oh Lord. Provide a pathway for peace. So therefore, God, we pray as you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Time for offering and prayer. Bring all tithes into the storehouse, 
that there may be meat in my house, and try me in this, saith the Lord. If I open not unto you the floodgates of heaven, and pour out a blessing even to abundance. Today let us give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness.
Thank you, choir, giving us uh, moving our hands and feet this morning. For all the people of God, those gathered in this place, those gathered in various places that they are worshiping with us virtually, those who are in need of the word from the Lord, and for those who are here to exhort and encourage one another, I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, central to our faith, the one in which we find ourselves placing our hope and trust. This morning, I want you to join with me as I read our scripture reference. It comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Scripture reads, and I'm reading from the NRSV version, declares this. Immediately he made, he being Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat, go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, about a mile or two, probably the coast. For the wind was against him. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Very familiar passage of scripture. One so familiar that I'd be willing to say that even our children can give you some of the basics. A text like this. Because it is the only time that we see it written anywhere that someone, and not just one, but two people walk on water. It is a passage, a story told of the disciples, one in which they are experiencing great tumultuous storm. And Jesus is the one to deliver them 
in it. I do make the distinction to say deliver them in it rather than out of it because it is true that there are sometimes we can be delivered out of things, but then there are other times where God will actually deliver us while we are still in things. That's good news for us this morning. I'm here to let you know that storms that they experience are not any different than storms that you and I can experience even today. And not just you and I experience, but if you are human and you live on this earth, if you are a resident of this world, living and moving and breathing in this world, then you will experience storms also. So one of my favorite writers, Frederick Buechner, used to say, here is the world. Good and terrible things will happen. Do not be afraid. I hear that as one who has written that in multiple books and resources, but I must admit, even as I communicate with you today that, that sometimes it's easier said than done to not be afraid. I sat here coming back from a vacation only to look at the news. To see what's happening in Lahaina, Hawaii where wildfires have taken over an entire island and people are dying by the tens death toll even almost at this point at 100 or maybe more. Hard to not say, to hear, but to not be afraid when we see governments that are displaying instability. Government officials being overthrown like in Nigeria or to see the civil unrest that continues to happen in places that are near and dear to us because they are near and dear to our worshiping community, places like Ethiopia and Cameroon and the Congo, places like Turkey where we find ourselves praying week in and week out, praying that God would make a change somewhere amidst the things that are happening in our world and yet we are encouraged to not be afraid. Here is the world. Good, terrible things seem to happen. Do not be afraid. There are some good things also. Our friends of the American Baptist Home Missionary Society, who just in the past two days were hearing of what was happening in Hawaii began to take as much money and resources as they could and as they can, still collecting them even now. We give to them so that they can give to areas that are hurting and they are giving, knowing that it will take millions of dollars, but they are not waiting for others to be involved, but they are actively seeking involvement to better those areas. That's a good thing, and that's part of our world, too. Here is the world. Good and terrible things happen. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of this, the chaos. Do not be afraid of this, those things that make us feel as if we are distant from God. We are not distant from God. Though we may feel it, we are called to not be afraid. In our text this morning, yes, we could spend a lot of time talking about Peter walking on water, but, but I believe that the text also speaks to us about fear. It speaks to us about doubt. It speaks to us about what it means to be a people of faith. 
leaning and trusting on Jesus, but also having things in our life that make us fearful, it speaks to us about what faith is in light of all of that. We are to not be trapped. Wedding, her, a galactic getaway. Here in the text, it's a boat crossing. They're crossing the sea. And this is not the first time that they have crossed the sea. If we have our memory back to Matthew chapter 8, we would see that the first time that they crossed a body of water, that was the first occurrence in, in Matthew chapter 8, and they were in the boat. And in that situation, Jesus was in the boat with them. The storm and the wind and the waves are blowing and they are saying, Lord, don't you care about us? We are about to perish, save us. And where is Jesus? He is there in the boat. Sleep on the pillow. Oh my God. Must have been some good sleep and some good rest. But not an easy rest. It can be hard to have peace and rest in the midst of a storm, but Jesus shows us that you can have peace and you can have rest even when everything else around you seems to be going out of control. So they see him. And he wakes up, he calms the sea. They ask, of what manner of man is this who can calm the sea? But then we get to chapter 14, which is our chapter today, and this time it's unique. Yes, there is a storm. Yes, the disciples are in the boat, but this is the first time since they have been called by Jesus, where Jesus has sent them and he did not go with them. You see, the other time he was in the boat with them, but this time Jesus has sent them on their way and he has sent them, but he has not gone with them. He stayed behind to pray and therefore they are in a storm this time by themselves. They are separated from his physical presence. This is different to them. I'm here to let you know that there are sometimes in the midst of our storms where you and I can feel very deeply the power and the presence of God and the things that we are going to. But, but if we are honest with ourselves this morning, there are some times in our lives when we are going through things and we are asking God, where are you in the midst of it? God, I felt your presence last time, but this time I don't feel you like I used to. And I know maybe you are not willing to talk back to me about that, but, but I will testify there have been some times when I beat my pillow at night. There have been some times when the tears have fallen and they could not stop in my life. It's not that I did not have faith in God, it's just that what I was used to, the feeling of God being that I did not feel God like I used to. Christians call that the dark night of the soul. They call it the liminal space, the space in between. There's the imagery in the text that we have this morning. There is a sea that separates them from Jesus. The four things I want to lift up in the text today that I Hope will be of encouragement to you, but first off, I, I want to lift up the sea of separation. The sea of separation. It is not lost on the writers that this experience that the disciples have had is not just an actual experience, but it is one that is also metaphorical in its application. Why? Because the sea of separation, the distance that they felt from Jesus was one of chaos, one of conflict, one in which they felt as the first century church as they were making sense of following one who had just been brutally crucified. 
bring them back to life again. And now they're saying, where is the kingdom of God coming in its fullness? They are trying to figure out how to manage life in the midst of that chaos. That was effort, but I ask you this morning, when you have felt separated from Jesus, what is it that you feel? Some might just say it's insecurity. It's, it's the insecurity of not knowing what is going to happen today or tomorrow or the next day. Okay, that's not yours. Maybe yours is the unknown. It's not known. If I make this decision and not that decision, then, then what will come of my life? Maybe that's not you. Maybe your separation is just that itself. Chaos of your life has caused you to question what you actually believe and know of oh God. The text lets us know that the disciples were separated from Jesus in this moment, and, and it's not too far of a stretch to say that we may experience or feel. We are also separated from God. But I'm glad the text does not leave us there. But I'm glad the text shows us that in the midst of that, Jesus declares himself in a way that they had not seen before. We've said that there's a seed of separation. Here's the second thing I'm lifting up to us today. I'm going to stay here this one for a while. We see a sea of separation, but we see a self-disclosing Savior. A self-disclosing Savior. There on the sea, as Jesus has done praying and he's walking back to the disciples, they, they believe they've seen a ghost, and so they are afraid at all. It's, it's between 3 a.m. 6 a.m. in the morning, and there is no World Cup game going on at this time. It's just dark with a lot of wind and a lot of waves, and it is there that they see Jesus who promised that he would come to them, but they didn't expect him to come the way that he was coming. He is walking to them on the water, and they are afraid, and Jesus sees that they are afraid, and he speaks to them, and he says, take hey, heart. It is I, do not be afraid. I want you to stop right now and in the Bible that you have, I want you to circle the words, it is I. Circle that in the Bible. Then out to the side of that, I want you to write Exodus 3. Verse 15. Self disclosing Savior. Jesus says, It is I. I had to do some digging in the original language, and it's Greek. And he says, It is I. And as I looked at that, that, that word that he used, or the two words that he used, it, it's, it's ego gamai. But historically, those two words don't fit together. If someone speaking Greek would say, I am, or it is I, all they would do was say, am I, e I, am I, am I, I am. Going to eat crab cakes today. I am wearing blue slacks today. But here in the text, Jesus discloses himself in a way that he has not disclosed himself before because he does not say, Am I alone? He says, Ego am I. I am. And that doesn't mean much to us until we think back to the last time that we have seen a phrase similar to that. And the last time we've seen a phrase similar to that is in Exodus chapter 3. 
when Moses walks by a burning bush and hears God calls out to him. God calls Moses to deliver the people of God out of Egyptian bondage. And he's going to do it by the Red Sea. But first, Moses has to get over who it is who's calling him. And so Moses says to him, who are you who calls me? And what does God say? God says, I am who I am. I am. God, the Old Testament. And so as Jesus is walking on the water, Jesus does not say, am I, or it is I, just like that. He says, I am. In other words, he is linking that who he is and who God is are one and the same. In the middle of the storm, Jesus reveals himself as the Ancient One. The Ancient of Days, Jesus reveals that when you have seen the Father, you have seen me. And when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I am that I am. How can I take heart in the midst of of the storms that I'm having in my life it is because I have placed my trust in Jesus who is the ancient of days. The I am revealed to Moses in the burning bush is present in Jesus when he says I am. The I am who was separated at the sea, who separated the sea from the dry land in Genesis is the same I am that's walking on the water to the disciples. The I am who made the waters from the Red Sea stand up so that they walk over on dry ground is the same I am that is there in the midst of the storm. The I am that is of the ancient of days is present with them. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me today. I don't just place my faith and trust in one trying to be like God, but I have placed my trust in the one who is God. Gardner C. Taylor says it like this. We talk about God in the past present future because that's the only way that our brain can work. Past things that have already happened, present things that are happening, and future things that will happen, but, but God is not, is not bound by our ways of thinking and understanding. And so though God allows us to play with past, present, and future, where we say God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, but because God is who God is, because God is I am, because God is I am that I am, when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about God, what we are really saying is that God is in an eternal state of isness. God is because God is. Main thing as God is. Jesus said, I am. Who delivered me out of the storm? Jesus says, I am. Who is the one who is creator in Genesis? Jesus says, I am. Who is the one that delivers them out of the body? Jesus says, I am. I am. Who is the one who, 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 who satisfies our hunger? Jesus says, I am the bread of God. Who is the one that brings us out of darkness? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Who is the one that finds me when I am lost? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Who is the one? Jesus says, I am. Alpha and Omega, who is it? Jesus says, I am the one that you have been looking for. For is me. And what 
what is he doing as he says, I am? He's walking on the wall. The water troubles the disciples. But Jesus walks on the wall. The water causes the issue. Jesus is present with them in the water. Friends, if there was one thing that we could take home with us today, it is that no matter what it is that you carry, it doesn't matter how heavy the burden is, he walks it with us. The old imagery of a Carries a load. You never seen the ox by itself. They're always one and one together. Because where it is too heavy for one to carry, the second one carries with it. And all I'm trying to say this morning is that God is the one that carries it with us. And although you think you're the strong ox in the situation you're in, I'm willing to let you know that even if you couldn't carry your weight, you would see who's really carrying it for and with you. Jesus says, I am. Not only that, but we see a shout of salvation. This is interesting. Peter is walking on water. But then he sees a strong wind. Peter becomes frightened and begins to sink. There he cries out, Lord, save me. There Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. Peter sees Jesus and Peter also sees and he has both stepped out of the boat and walked on water and Peter has also sank in the water. Peter's both triumphant in his faith because he's walked out on the water and Peter is also troubled by what he sees and is sinking in the water. He's walked on water and he also begins to sink in it. He's walking out in faith and he's also desperately distracted in his faith. And I love this about Peter and I love this about this text. That one person can be both the perfect example of faithful discipleship and the perfect example of fear and doubt in the same time. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. Because I'm willing to bet that most of us want to live a faithful life. And yet most of us have experienced times in our life where our faith has been less than what we have desired. But God is still a God who loves us whether we have great faith or have little faith. God is still faithful to us. God is still faithful to Peter. The same God who loves Peter because he had enough faith to step out of the boat is the same God who loves Peter who's sinking in the water. Lord, save me. And God immediately saves him. Mm. That gets me different as a young folks say. Because it's not predicated my faith of one who I trust. Tim Keller, late great pastor and author, written the reason for God. An analogy, a metaphor that helps to drive this point home is imagine you are on a high cliff. And you fall off the high cliff, and there is a branch there, he says. 
And you have all of the intellect, and even great faith, that that branch can hold you. He says, you will still fall at the bottom of that cliff. But, he says, if you have a little faith, you have questions about whether or not that branch can support you. You've got questions and doubts about whether it can. But you reach out and grab that branch in faith. That branch will save you. Here's the point. It is not the strength of your faith that saves you. Oh, ye of little faith here. But it is the object of your faith that actually saves you. I'm going to say that again because you might miss that. It's not the strength of your faith that saves you. It is the object of your faith that saves. Saving faith is not about how grand your faith is. It is about how grand the object of your faith is. I can have little faith and I can have doubts and still be saved because it is not dependent on my faith, it's dependent on the one who my faith is in. Oh, that's good news for us this morning. Here the word. Good, terrible things will happen. Do not Trust then him. One who calms sea and storms away. Really most interesting about this passage is that the last time they went and told Jesus had to say a few things. See the waves and the wind. This time, when Peter calls out, Jesus reaches in and saves him. They get in the boat. This time, Jesus says nothing to the wind. Just that wind and waves just stop. Jesus brought peace. I want to let you all know this morning because I know that this passage has been preached in a zillion different ways and some would say if Peter just would have had a little bit more faith would have never saw and I possibly true but I, I want to I want to help us with that what what you end up doing is saying that people who go through circumstances are going through because they don't have enough faith. And I don't believe that that is really what the text is saying this morning, and I don't believe that that is consistent with our theology. The faith that you have. Example of love faith. Trust in the one who saves. The faith you have. But God, I, I can't, I can't, I can't do what I've seen other people do. God, I, I can't preach like other people preach. God, I can't. The faith you have is ample enough to trust the one who saves. Lord, save me. You remember the gospels. Lord, help my unbelief. Y'all remember that prayer? What did Jesus do? Here. That was enough. This morning, someone needs to be reminded that it's okay to be weak. It's okay to 
not feel like you are enough. You are enough. Face what you have in him. Reach out. Grab hold. Because you weren't supposed to move the mountain. Faith you must have seen in Jesus is what moves the mountain. What calms the sea and the storm is what brings true peace, regardless of what happens around you. So that's the world. Those are the beautiful things are born to happen. Do not be afraid. Let's sing him 510. Jesus is all.
You can take some children for a few hours when you do that. If you can clean the house, then you walk on that. Let us strengthen one another through our storms that we go through because we embody the power and presence and spirit of God in the work that we do in front of us. My brother and sister in the back, I would love to meet you all and even you follow the service. But don't get out of here without shaking my hand. <laughs> and now receive these words. May the one who seeks you find you when you fall. May the one who loves you take the light in your living. And may the one who sends you, send you now in joy. For in your gladness and in your grieving, in your brokenness and in your healing, in your faithfulness and in your leaving, the one who made you and redeemed you, saves you out and even in the storm.